Welcome back to our third and final panel of the day as we examine the younger generation born after 1980. This one is the panel most appropriate, I guess, for the city in which we meet, Washington, because it's about how young people perceive politics and government, what their views are on the issues of the day, and how they choose to engage in political life or not. When I traveled around the United States in the midterm election year 2006, and again this year, looking to see how the, the younger generation was being affected by the recession, and I, when I say this year, I'm really talking about last 2009, I found some strong views, I found a surprising confidence, and even a bit of wisdom. Here's a minute's worth of what we found. We have to be wiser with our decisions than uh, and how we handle things with the economy, with uh, energy, than, uh, few, than previous generations have. We grew up with things like will and grace right. and you know having that in the comfort of our home. And so we've grown up with it and it's you been a part up. of our lives. And it's not groundbreaking in the least bit to have boring. interracial couples. Our generation seriously thinks that no matter what comes to you, there's, a, uh, there's a, an answer to your problem. That's right, an answer to your problem, and you can find it right here in Washington, D.C. <laughs> well, with us is yet another excellent panel of individuals uniquely qualified to talk about our topic, all of whom I am sure are going to have those answers. Let's meet them, starting with Matt Bai, and I'm going to ask them to come up and take a seat as I introduce them. Matt is the contributing politics writer for the New York Times Magazine, where he covered both the 2004 and the 2008 presidential campaigns. He has done much commented upon cover stories, including on President Obama's health care strategy. And he has written often about issues of generational change in American politics and society. His book, The Argument, was about the rise of the first Internet age political movement. Eli Pariser founded a website in the aftermath of the September 11th terror attacks, and then at the ripe age of 20, he helped to oversee its merger with the progressive organization MoveOn.org, which the New York Times Magazine called the mainstream arm of the peace movement. He led MoveOn to become the first place where large numbers of small donations could be mobilized through online engagement. He is now president of MoveOn's board. Rehan Salam, Rehan, where are you? Come on up is a fellow and a policy advisor for the New America Foundation and the author of the much acclaimed 2008 book titled Grand New Party, How Conservatives Can Win the Working Class and Save the American Dream. Rehan writes about politics, about culture, and about technology. He's a columnist for Forbes.com and for the Daily Beast. And from Pew are two panelists who will be making the presentation of their survey findings. First, Michael Dimmock. Where are you, Mike? Come on up. Associate Director for Research at the Pew Research Center. He is principally responsible for the development of the center's research projects, including questionnaire design and data analysis. He has published multiple articles on public opinion, voting behavior, and survey methodology. And Scott Keeter, a Director of Survey Research here at the Pew Research Center and co-author of four books, including... A new engagement, question mark, political participation, civic life, and the changing American citizen, which included special focus on the younger generation compared to its elders. Scott has also written on political communications and behavior, and since 1980, he's been an election night analyst of exit polls for NBC News. Now, after Scott and Michael finish, uh, the panel will talk, uh, again, same pattern. We're going to talk for about 45 minutes, just the panel, and then we're going to turn to you in the audience. Scott Keeter, you are on first. Thank you, Judy, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, first, I'm going to start with something that isn't news, and that is that the millennials made a big splash in 2008. Everybody knows that. Um, according to the exit polls, uh, the level of support for the Democratic candidate by uh, young people was relative to the votes of everybody else was greater. That disparity was greater in 2008 than it has ever been in the history of exit polling. Um, Sixty-six percent of the millennial generation voted for Barack Obama in 2008 versus 
uh, only about 53 percent of the uh, of the voting public overall. And as you can see in the right-hand pair of bars, that difference there is quite large compared uh, with, with other years. But even before 2008, the millennials were looking like a very strong Democratic uh, constituency. Fifty-four percent of them voted for John Kerry in 2004. That was his best age group. And 60 percent of them voted for Democratic candidates for Congress um, in the 2006 congressional elections. So one thing that we can take away from this is that while the millennials really like uh, Barack Obama, and they still like him, um, and they voted for him at very high levels, um, their impact on politics over the past several years was not just about Obama. They are not an Obama phenomenon. Their liberalism and democratic leanings predate Obama. Now, aside from how they voted in these elections, Another notable aspect was their level of engagement in terms of voter turnout. Um, the gap between voter turnout um, between younger and older voters has been quite large um, over the past uh, 30 or 40 years. This is um, a couple of pictures, uh, lines showing you voter turnout among people in the 18 to 29 age group and people 30 and older going back to 1972 at the time that 18 to 20 year olds got the uh, got the vote. Um, the gap through this period, uh, at least since about 1980, has been quite sizable, 20 percentage points or more. And there was evidence going up to the 2000 election that this gap was actually getting wider rather than narrower. Uh, there was a, an uptick in voter turnout in the uh, very engaging presidential election of 1992. But after that, you, you really had a very wide gap, uh, reaching 25 points in, in uh, the 2000 election. But uh, in the 2004 election, uh, young people turned out at significantly uh, higher level. The, the, their, their voter turnout overall uh, rose from 40 percentage points to 49 percent. Um, the voter turnout of older people went up a little bit as well but not by nearly as much, with the result that the gap between younger and older people in terms of turnout narrowed to 19 points. And then in the, um, in the 2008 election, the gap narrowed again, it, not as dramatically as the difference between 2000 and 2004, but um, there was some uptick in turnout among young people and maybe even a little bit of a downtick among older people with the result that the gap uh, stood at 16 percentage points in 2008. Well, what is it that it really accounts for this movement of young people towards the Democratic Party through this period, as well as their high level of engagement in politics? Um, as you've heard today, this is a very uh, diverse generation, race, racially and ethnically, um, and that, of course, matters politically because non-whites, as we've heard uh, earlier, are more likely to vote Democratic. Um, and just to give you a sense of how much the, the electorate of young people changed between 2000 and 2008, I have a couple of statistics from the exit polls. Um, in 2008, just 62 percent of young voters were white, 62 percent. 18 percent of them were black, 14 percent were Hispanic, um, and others of, of mixed race or other races. By comparison, eight years earlier, nearly three-quarters of young voters were white. So from 74 percent in 2000 down to 62 percent white uh, in 2008. But even more than race and ethnicity, the millennial generation has uh, very different values in many important uh, politically relevant respects compared with their elders. Before I show you some of the trends that we've documented in these values, let me say a word about how we know what we know about these things. Um, the Center has been tracking American political values for over 20 years. Starting in 1987, the Times Mirror Center conducted a series of studies on American political values where we asked upwards of 80 questions in a survey touching on areas such as culture, race, um, government, foreign, military affairs, and the like. We've taken in each of the surveys that we've conducted these questions and we've separated them by subject area and then we've made summary indexes of 
uh, the values in, in like related areas so that we can track uh, movement of attitudes over time using exactly the same methods. And we've done this in order to do uh, such analyses as a comparison of the values of Democrats and Republicans. And so a couple of years ago, we documented how much more polarized American politics had become. The values of Democrats and Republicans had gotten further apart uh, over time. We can do the same thing with generations. Um, because we've asked these questions 14 times since 1987 in exactly the same way, um, we can actually take the generations, not just the age groups, but the people according to their birth cohorts, and we can track them when they first appear in our survey, and then we can follow them over time in, in a process that's, that's called a cohort analysis. Um, that way we can see not only how uh, a particular birth cohort is changing uh, in response to the events of the moment, uh, but then when a new cohort comes in, we can see uh, where they stand on these value questions compared with not only the, their elders at that point in time, but also at um, earlier generations when they were the same ages. So hopefully that um, will become clear when I show you a couple of the, of the charts that we have. Uh, let me start with the area where I think we see the greatest difference between younger and older cohorts. And that's on social, social and cultural values. Here we're talking about questions relating to the acceptance of homosexuality, um, interracial dating, expanded roles uh, for, for women, immigrants, and, and the like. And there are a lot of different questions that can go into this. This particular index has about five items. So here are the trends. The first line that I have up there, this uh, sort of yellowish line, is uh, the silent generation, the oldest of the cohorts that, that we're tracking here. If I put the greatest generation, born even before the silent generation up there, the line would be even higher. Now, on this particular chart, lines that are high on the page will be conservative uh, social values, and as we add more lines, you'll see there's a, a, an increasing liberal trend. So uh, this is the line for the baby boomers. So um, even when we first started, they were already fully established as a, as a birth cohort in our surveys, and they were significantly less conservative than the silent generation. And also, as you can see over time, there hasn't been a lot of change. In other words, the line isn't going up or down particularly, so social values of the sort that we're measuring there have only moved a little bit. They've become a little more liberal, but not uh, a whole lot. This is Generation X. Uh, when they first appear as a full birth cohort in 1994, they too are more um, liberal socially, less conservative socially, and uh, while there are some bumps up and down, they continue to be distinctive from the other two cohorts. That's the millennial generation, the orange line. They are uh, by far uh, the least socially conservative generation, and it looks like that's going to be the pattern that's going to continue if what we've seen in the past um, bears up. In another area, one that's very important uh, politically, um, we have a set of questions that uh, tap attitudes about government, attitudes towards whether government should be doing more, whether uh, government um, is uh, inefficient and wasteful or does a better job than, than, it, than, than we generally think that it does. And on this one, the higher lines are going to be the more liberal positions. So we start out again with the silent generation, and you see that while there have been ups and downs, there's a little dip in the line there about a third of the way through. That's 1994, when everybody was pretty conservative. Uh, that's the baby boom. They started out somewhat more liberal in terms of support for government than the silent generation. Um, but they have really converged with the silent generation over time, with their views uh, coming closer to theirs. That's Generation X, um, even more supportive uh, than the baby boomers, although when they first arrived, it was in the very anti-government uh, uh, sentiment of 1994, and that's the millennial generation. So we don't see enormous differences across the cohorts, but they are pretty consistent, and they've remained uh, fairly distinctive, again, with the exception of um, the uh, uh, baby boomers and the silent generation converging in the last uh, couple of times that we've done these surveys. Now, we've done a lot of these, and I won't take up uh, the time that I think we want to have here for uh, further discussion about the, some of the implications of what we'll present. 
uh, telling you about other value dimensions, but uh, young people do stand out on some other ones, especially on questions relating to equal rights and even affirmative action. Um, you can see that, again, there's the same pattern of the older generations being somewhat more conservative, less supportive <coughs> of uh, equal rights and affirmative action, and the millennials being uh, the most liberal. On some other issues that uh, we've tracked, we don't see particular uh, differences. Uh, for example, attitudes about business uh, are, are not very different across the generations and don't seem to be uh, taking any particular tack. One of the uh, oddest things, I think, from, from our work over the past few years is that even with the terrible recession and the, uh, uh, the, the fury that's been aimed at Wall Street, general attitudes about business in our uh, 2009 survey taken in the teeth of all of this did not show a, a particular uptick in anti-business sentiment. And the same was true for, for the millennials. If I showed you that graphic, uh, the lines would actually just be all, all clustered together. Similarly, we don't see very big differences in, in the, among the generations in attitudes about the social safety net. Um, and so there are some areas in which uh, young people and older people don't differ too much. One final one I'll mention in which we have seen a little bit of a difference uh, actually emerging this uh, past year are, are attitudes about the use of military force. Young people have, uh, have been showing uh, somewhat greater reluctance to use military force. They are, are actually uh, somewhat less satisfied with the way Obama is handling the situation in Afghanistan. They're more opposed to the increase in, um, in uh, troop levels there than other generations. But over time, we haven't seen a lot of differences uh, on this particular set of, of value questions. Now, what we have seen here are some differences that are interesting and certainly politically relevant. And as we can see for some of them, they, these things have persisted. But not everything is immutable. And uh, the past year has been a particularly challenging one for the Democratic Party. For a look at what's happened to uh, the millennial generation and their attachment to the Democrats, I'll hand the clicker over to my colleague, Michael Dimmock. Great. Thanks, Scott. I, I think the, the themes that I'm picking up from the sessions today are that you know, there really are values that millennials hold that set them apart, that there's a characteristic, there's a profile of this generation that's interesting. Um, that is shaped by demography, it's shaped by sort of sociology in, in listening to Neil Howe, it's shaped by the environment that they're arriving into. And the question from a political perspective is how does that play out now and into the future uh, as a voting block? Uh, and we started this conference with Andy and Scott reminding us that they, this is a generation that's already felt a little bit of political power and, a, and, and an influence in recent elections. Can Democrats count on that kind of support from this generation now and into the future? The suggestion from these slides Scott's showing us is that these characteristics in terms of values tend to be sticky. In other words, while the, the mood of the public or the values of the public may ebb and flow towards government over time, the relative distance between generations tends to stay. And so the characteristics of this generation relative to others are likely to be robust. Is that mean that this is a, you know, that, that suggests that this is a generation that ought to be favorable to the Democrats now and into the future if those values differences do persist? But are they going to be able to hold on to two to one margins like they had in 2008 and count on that from this generation as a voting block? Let's use 2008 as a jumping off point, and then I'll talk a little bit about what we're seeing already in terms of what this means. What I'm doing here is I'm taking the data we collected in 2008, and I'm sort of taking a cross-section of the public. So across the bottom in our ridiculously small fonts here, uh, we've laid out the youngest people over on the left and the oldest people over on the right. So I've taken a, a cross-section of the, of the electorate in the year 2008. And the point of this is to show how distinctive the millennials are. The millennials are over on the left, and this is the balance of party identification in all of the polling that we conducted over the course of the year. Uh, among the millennials, 62% either called themselves Democrats. We say, do you consider yourself a Democrat, Republican, or independent? And if you're independent, we say, well, do you lean more towards the Democrats or more towards the Republicans? These are sort of standard metrics, uh, and one of the values is they, they, we can trend them over time. 62% um, of young people either identified or lean Democratic, 30% identify or lean Republican, mirroring, of course, the outcome of the election, a two-to-one 
uh, margin for, for Barack Obama. And you see that's pretty distinctive. You know, the breakpoints aren't exactly along the generational lines that we're using here for analytical purposes, but quite distinctive from the other generations. One of the reasons I start with this kind of unusual cross-sectional approach to thinking about it is it's a way of thinking about what the future might look like. Because basically, as time passes, these generations are going to move to the right along this graph, right? And it, are the young people going to be a pig in the python, so to speak, a big democratic bubble that just persists as they get older into the generation? And it's interesting to look back at some of the older generations in this chart. You can kind of see in the middle of the baby boomers, there's a little hump sort of around the middle of that chart. These are folks in their mid to late 50s right now. Um, that's sort of the folks who really were coming of age in the late Vietnam years and the, in the Watergate era. This is, was a very democratic generation when they first came into the electorate. Gallup polls conducted in 1974 when these folks were in their, 19, were in their 20s and late teens um, showed a 47% to 17% Repub democratic advantage in identification. That's even more overwhelming than what we're seeing right now among millennials not necessarily surprising given the circumstances and the context. You still see some echo of that democratic advantage in this group, but it's certainly more muted than it was in the peak moment of 1974. And the question looking forward, I think, is, is 2008 a kind of peak moment like that, that, that defines a generation, shapes a generation, but is it always going to remain that distinct and that separate from the rest of the population? Let me switch this a little bit to more traditional plot of the balance of party identification in the electorate over the last 10 years. So here we're going from 2000 on the left over to 2008 right now. And this is, in the bold lines, the balance of party identification, including leaners, among millennials. And you see that even when we first start measuring them in 2003, 2004, they're already more democratic than the rest of the public, which is shown with the lighter dashed lines. Um, Apropos to Scott's point, right from the start, they were showing value differences from the rest of the public and were already voting more Democratic in 04 and 06. But that in, by 2008, which I highlighted here, because that's the, the cross, where I took the cross section I just showed you, we see that getting even more extreme. The, the gap between millennials and the rest of the public gets even wider uh, to that 62 to 30 percent margin. Already, as Scott prefaced, 2009 has been a somewhat rougher year for Democrats in terms of their image. You know, Obama's ratings are down from what were potentially particularly high, particular highs at the start of his presidency. What's happened to the balance of party ID over the course of the past year is a convergence, again, a kind of return to where we were in the earlier part of the 2000s. Um, but that the movement, the, the sort of ebbing of democratic fortunes has been particularly notable among the millennials themselves. The proportion of millennials who identify or lean democratic has fallen from 62 percent in 2008 as a whole to 54 percent in the fourth quarter of 2009. To kind of give more texture to this, we've broken 2009 into quarters, because really the democratic losses started to take place in the later part of 2009 as a year. The percent identifying or leaning Republican has already bounced up from 30 percent in 2008 to 40 percent at the fourth quarter of 2009. And the thing to keep in mind behind all of this is that you know, the values are likely stable. We haven't updated all the values trends every year. But that political events matter. You know, and the environment and the circumstances of 2008 were extreme. You had uh, a change candidate who represented youthfulness and diversity by his very nature. Uh, you had an extremely unpopular incumbent president to younger people who rejected mo many of the things that George W. Bush stood for. Uh, that created an environment that, that was really you know, a set a, 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 where young people could get mobilized and were very sort of strong in their democratic leaning. The other thing that's important to keep in, in mind behind this is I am tracking in these slides Democrats and Democratic leaners, and I've sort of blurred that distinction, but it's not an irrelevant one. The plurality of young people are independents. When we say, do you think of yourself as a Democrat, Republican, or independent, they're saying independent by very wide margins. Now, that's characteristic of youth. That's not unusual. But Democrats never really closed the deal with young people through this period, even in 2008, Young millennials were no more likely to call themselves Democrats than any other generation. They were just more likely to lean Democratic than other generations. They never really fully pulled into the political party. And the erosion that you're seeing here reflects that sort of lack of firm attachment to the party. 
The counterpoint to that is the Republican Party, even though you're seeing this 10-point rise here, that's mostly a rise, again, in leaning, not people who right out of the gate call themselves Republicans. The Republican Party has had a very difficult time getting traction among this generation. Even in this fourth quarter of 2009, only 24 percent of the millennials think of themselves as Republicans. That's a very low number and hasn't really come up even from 2008. So to the extent that 09 gives us a launching point to think about the future 2010 and beyond, uh, I think is where we can move I'm on. I'm going to pick up with this final question and turn to Eli Paris, or this notion that in, in less than a year, in the course of a year, that democratic uh, leaning, that democratic uh, attraction has taken a dramatic hit. Um, does that square with your understanding of what's happened, what you see and feel out there uh, among grassroots supporters of Move On? Well, um, <clears throat> you know, I would say uh, that among young people, between, I mean, among you know, and and I was thinking about this for this panel because I, I think I'm 14 days short of being a millennial, actually. <laughs> uh, 1980, December 17th. They'll probably uh, let you in. Yeah, yeah sure. I'd, <laughs> honorary. I'm knocking on the door. So. Uh, it, you know, uh, among, uh, you know, and, and move on actually over the course of 2008 added about two million uh, new members, many of whom were, uh, yeah, many of whom were, were millennials. Um, you know, the, the, uh, my main thought on this actually uh, goes to something that I think you wrote recently about the kind of, um, uh, malleable, movable. Just going to steal my points now? Is that yeah, right? no. I, <laughs> what am I going to say? What am I going to talk about? This is remix culture, Matt. Right. You know, we're. You know, so so you know the the, the fact that uh, I, I think history will will show, but I'm not sure that the kind of allegiance to brands um, as a lifelong commitment in general. Uh, is as true of this group as of previous groups. I think, you know, I, I would expect to see more variance and, and uh, 2008 as a high point, but, um, you know, a lot of variance in, in real time as people are adjusting to uh, a very quickly changing world. And that kind of flexibility, I think, is a characteristic of, um, you know, of, of this group. So I, I don't think that... Uh, I think there's something real happening there. I also think that it's less, uh, it may be less significant than it looks when you're looking at other generations that change much more slowly. Uh, from the other perspective, uh, Rehan, uh, from, the, from the perspective of conservatives, Republicans, whatever, in the label, whether you call it you know, Republican, conservative, or what, it, 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 it improved, the picture improved. But as we just heard Michael say, it's, it's, there's still this reluctance to, to uh, happily attach the label it's of, of Republican. It's, it's leaning. Funny story. So the term that we use, conservatism, to describe this political tendency, Bill Buckley, when he wrote God and Man at Yale, called it individualism. And then later on, someone gave it the name conservatism to associate it with this kind of older American tradition. But the name was a little arbitrary in a way. And you see a lot of folks who call themselves progressives now who would have called themselves pro uh, liberals in another generation. When you look at democratic identifiers circa the 1960s, think about what that meant. What that meant if you were living in the Deep South and you were identifying as a member of the Democratic Party or were you in the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. It means a lot of different things. So we look at these seemingly stable categories over a long period of time, and you know they're useful, they're helpful in some ways. They describe certain things usefully and other things less usefully. But I think that you know the thing is these categories actually are quite unstable. They mean different things at different times. And I think that that's the thing that I think of as most distinctive about this moment and also about this generation. Uh, so you can have someone who described themselves as a Democrat, as a diehard Democrat in 1974, Watergate baby, someone who kind of looked at the world in that particular way. Then when they were voting you know, for Bill Clinton in 1992, this person was perhaps in a very different class position. They had a different mix of issues that they cared about, et cetera. And they lived in a different part of the country. So I think that that's one thing to keep in mind. I think that when you're looking at these kind of broad contours of American ideological change, we talked about social liberalism and social conservatism. Uh, and about how that's changed over time. Well, you know, you have lots of dispute about, for example, views on abortion and a lot of other little things like that. One thing that you see, though, is that this generation considers those social issues somewhat less politically salient. There are less intense voting issues than they were for somewhat older folks. And then also another thing to think about is, 
are you a social liberal or a social conservative if you embrace the views of everyone who's around you, your family, everyone in your neighborhood, everyone who is, you know, kind of shares your broad sensibility? So it, what kind of impulse is that we call that liberal, because that way you're both a liberal if you live in Austin, Texas, or, you know, Sugarland, Texas, if you have these particular sets of views. But in terms of your sensibility, the way that you approach the world, the way that you think about things, are you someone who actually breaks the mold? Are you someone who is a contrarian by nature? It actually doesn't tell you all that much. And I think that when you're looking at our politics right now, I think that the, the really interesting comparison is to a moment like the late 60s. You saw a magazine like The Public Interest, and there was Bill Kristol, and there was Daniel Bell, and then there was Charles Reich. Charles Reich then wrote The Greening of America and became a kind of hero to the hippies. And then Bill Kristol became a kind of avid defender of, of, Nick, uh, of Nixon. You have this moment of incredible political discontinuity right now. And so I can't tell you what's going to happen to these different partisan identifiers or what have you. What I can tell you is that realignments ain't what they used to be. Uh, you know, you used to see a realignment, and it could, would last for a long period of time, and now things seem to be moving a lot faster. This is a kind of view that Matt has raised, among others. Now there's really nothing left for me. I'm sorry. <laughs> so I just kind of caution us to kind of think a little bit about, you know, kind of what these categories mean, how they're shifting. When I think of Move On, I think of a group that actually is a funny mix of things. It's a civil society group that is partisan in some respects, but it's also a group that's not it's a different kind of special interest group. And I think that they're very explicit about that. And then when you look at you know, what's happening in the Tea Party movement, how do these guys feel about an issue like Afghanistan? You know, uh, how are they going to feel about an issue like that six months from now? If you think you know the answer to that, then you know a heck of a lot more than I do. But. All right, Matt, we're going to finally let you <laughs> have a word here. You know, let me just... Uh, uh, I, that, that, was, that was exceptionally, in, both in, exceptionally insightful on this, I think. But w when we talk about generational change, I'm not a social scientist, so just looking at it from, you know, the sort of dumbed-down perspective of journalism. When you talk about generational change, right, it's not actually where you, and, and I'm sure you guys would agree with me, you know, it's not a flip of a switch. If you're 20 to 32, you're in this category and you're 33. It, it happens very gradually and it, and it permeates those boundaries. So I would submit that this president, right, is actually on the leading edge. He's a few years older than I am. He's, you know, he just makes the boom, but n nobody really would put him in that category, right? He's on the leading edge of a much broader generational shift happening in the country that, as you filter down to what we're calling millennials, is much more distilled and apparent, but is really happening from a much older age level down. And it, it's... it's uh, it can be looked at, you know, as having a variety. It's, it's, it can be looked at as having a variety of characteristics. I think the defining characteristic that of that generational change, uh, and it's it's social and it's cultural and it's uh, technological, is this breakdown of loyalty to institutions, uh, generally, because uh, you know this probably has its roots in the Watergate period, right, and in the, the questioning of government generally, which brought a lot of boom, uh, you know, boomers and people just older than the boomers, like President Obama, into, into political consciousness. Um, it, we see it in, it's probably affected by scandals in trusted institutions like steroids in baseball or the Catholic Church, the failure of companies like General Motors, the failure of the banks. Uh, and it's certainly technological in the sense that uh, you know, you don't, the, the, the internet has really broken down institutional hegemony. I mean, I just went and got a mortgage for another house. I mean, you, you, you don't go to the bank, you go online. It took me five minutes to compare all the rates. Some guy called me up right away, and, you know, you start the process. I mean, uh, Daniel Pink, the writer, has called us free agent nation. I, I think that's a great term. I would actually say we're a nation of comparative shoppers, in a sense. I mean, that is the ethos of this generation and the generations, to a certain extent, that are older. So anybody who lives their lives online... So, as you point out, you know, what that means is that uh, that's going to obviously translate to party loyalty. It means that while you can ask people what their party identification is, and you, as you point out, they're going to mostly be independent, and then you kind of nudge them ever so gently into a camp, you can't really figure out how their view of identification to a party is different from somebody else's. And uh, I think just based on their attitudes about institutions, they're going to be... Uh, it's not surprising to me at all that you would lose eight points in a, you know, in a quarter or whatever it is, because... They're going to move around. They, I think they really liked Obama a lot. I think they, they will identify with personalities. Uh, I think they certainly, the opposite was true with Bush. I think they are repelled by personalities. But whether or not that creates an institutional loyalty, I think it probably does not. And so I do think we're going to have, as, as, as Rahim says, a, a faster movement of realignments. And it's why, you know, Democrats who are shocked now say, wow, we had this 40-year realignment going in 2008. 
it was all said, and I was on, I, I remember doing, doing panels like this one where people said, you know, we're gonna have a 40 year, this is a Rooseveltian realignment, and two years later they can't understand how they're <laughs> battling to keep the house. It should show you the stupidity of making grand pronouncements. Because, uh, <laughs> because in, in fact, our realignments aren't gonna be 40 years, they're gonna be 40 months if you're super lucky, maybe 40 days, maybe 40 minutes, depending on you know, what's happening on cable news. Go ahead, yeah. Well, let me speak to, uh, Eli. Um, you know, one other piece of, I think, what's going on here, which is, um, you know, I think this is a uh, generation, we are a generation, uh, uh, tuned into form and as well as content. So, um, you know, uh, participation in institutions, in uh, ideas, in, um, you know, I in political life, is actually kind of baked into the structures that we're familiar with. Before I went on this, uh, yesterday I posted to my Facebook page, um, what should I say on the panel uh, <laughs> at the Millennials Conference, and I got like 30 uh, you know, comments, so I don't have to actually do any thinking. But, <laughs> and, and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and one of them uh, you know, was about this thing about you know, that, that part of what's going on is the, the Obama campaign was a form that was very familiar to uh, these people. It was an open forum. You could go on. You could form groups. You could find other people. This looks a lot like Facebook. It feels like the kind of stuff we know. The Obama government um, you know, has had trouble uh, creating a, a form of government that feels as participatory as, uh, you know, as the campaign was uh, for many of us who, who were part of it. So all the government needs to do is just, I mean, all the White House is become an extension of Facebook as... Uh, That's right. I think <laughs> Facebook, uh, White House, you know, but, and actually, they, you know, they are trying to do this, and I think it does change, you know, Barack Obama appears in my friend feed every, every you know, uh, six days and has a little pronouncement or something, and, uh, and, it's, and it's interesting. It's not quite right because uh, it's, it, you know, I think the other piece is about authenticity, and I know that that's some uh, you know, person in the DNC typing that in and not actually the president. But, uh, no. you know. <laughs> but that does, I mean, but, but actually in some ways false authenticity is worse than, than no authentic, you know, than, than just staying out of those spaces. Scott and Michael, help us um, um, dig a little bit deeper into what was this attachment to Obama and the Democrats in 2008 all about. I mean, how much of it was the person and the Facebook manifestation, whatever, and how much of it was, was something deeper or longer lasting? I, I mean, I think the, the, um, the points that have been made about the way in which the campaign was run, speaking to the way in which young people were thinking and inter interacting are, are very good ones. And so in that sense, I think there was something special about Obama, if not personally, about the way he ran the campaign that made young people a more important part of the campaign effort than it might have been had Hillary Clinton prevailed. But I'm also a fairly strong believer that based on the, um, the value profiles and the issue attitudes that we saw, attitudes about the wars and so forth, that Hillary Clinton would have done about as well as Obama did in terms of the split of the vote. But in terms of the energy that was put behind the campaign, that may have uh, depended partly on the on the personality of Obama and who he was as a person, and also upon the way in which he ran the campaign. You think she would have done as well as he did among younger voters? I think you, it would have been very similar, simply because we saw 60 percent of them vote for Democratic candidates in the House races in 2006. And I, I mean, sure, there were plenty of charismatic candidates, but there were probably plenty that were not. And they, you know, young people disproportionately gave their votes to the Democrats. I think what, what, you know, what a lot of people are interested in, in is, is getting at what is the sticky part of that, you know, for the Democrats. What is it that young people can be counted on to continue to like about what they see Democrats doing in time? And what is it that Republicans can, can come in and whether they're leaning Republican or whatever can come in and hope to pick off? Mm. Who wants to, you know, explore that a little bit? I mean, one thought is that, um, you know, we kind of have this funny situation in which we have two conservative parties right now in the United States. And by that, I mean conservative in terms of sensibility. You saw this year the Republicans do something that, ironically, a lot of so-called Republican reformers advocated for a long time, which is you saw the party respond to their constituency, and their constituency is old. 
they're white. And if you're looking at incumbent legislators who want to win re-election, they were very keenly aware of the fact that they feel very strongly about Medicare. Now, the same exact kind of trimming of the growth of Medicare that Republicans pursued in the 1990s uh, as a way of financing tax cuts and a variety of other measures uh, were pretty strongly attacked. It became a bedrock principle. Jim DeMint, the great tribune of the Tea Party movement, has explicitly said that protecting uh, our, you know, kind of the agreement, the pledge that we made to seniors is vitally important. So you have this one political party that, given its demographic balance, is, uh, ra you know, racked by this kind of deep contradiction. And then you have another political party that is conservative in a, in a subtly different but also important sense. Um, you know, the Democrats are very interested in kind of minimizing the kind of economic pain that you're seeing over the course of this recession for lots of good and complicated reasons. Whereas in the early 1980s, Reagan, who many people compare Obama to, made this very different deal. Uh, you know, Reagan and Volcker basically, you know, kind of engineered an incredibly punishing recession, a punishing recession that led to liquidation of a lot of sectors, et cetera. This very different thing. But that was an era when you had lots of Americans who remember the Depression or who remembered what we forget now, it's that in that early part of the 50s or right after the war, there was a huge economic, it was a very different period of some privation, tremendous anxiety, and a sense that, you know what, this is something that can happen. And now we're in this era of the great moderation. The millennial generation hasn't experienced a wrenching recession. This is what it is to them. And so I think that that creates a kind of affluence trap in which actually some of the things that we want to see in terms of real transformative change, whether you're on the far left or the far right, actually are just not possible. People have too much to give up right now, particularly people who are under 30 who kind of have no real subjective experience of what really wrenching economic change is like. And I think that that is actually a big player in how our politics will likely play out. And it's one reason why it's not the filibuster or something like that. I think that that's the reason why really big ticket dramatic reforms are just going to be very hard and will only happen when there's a perception of real exigency. And Matt, by how disillusioning is that to young people who, I don't, you know, whether you put them high or low on a, a scale of idealism. Um, well, I mean, you know, I, I had to think about this, while, you know, looking at the numbers and having read the report before, is you all do about as much as you can do to try and put the generations in context to one another. But, you know, the truth is, Young Americans have been liberal since, you know, the first caveman started an anti-spear campaign. You know, it's, it's just, it is, and, 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 and they've been disillusioned since that time as well. And uh, this is like a hallmark But isn't of, this one more liberal than other well, generations were? I'm asking, I don't know, is that true, Scott? It's, it's a little hard to say. I mean, as I said, you know, in 1974, boomers were extremely democratic, certainly. Um, even back in the 50s, you know, the silent generation leaned very heavily Democratic, more so than today. So there is some sign that there's that. And the Xers, in some way, are the outlier in all of that. Even when Xers right. were in their teens and early 20s, they were coming of age in that late Reagan era where things looked good. We had won the Cold War. You know, the, the, the economy had come back from those early recessions. And this is that imprint has really stuck with that generation. So it's not a universal, but I think, right. you know, it does. It does you still have to put it in, it, it, when you put it in relation to where the society is on a lot of these attitudes, right? It, it certainly it may be constant. Um, but I, I do think this point about the economic situation is very interesting. You, you guys pointed out in the numbers early on uh, the, uh, the, the attitudes toward banks and business hadn't changed. I noticed another number in your report about people, had, millennials feeling actually quite confident about their economic futures. Uh, what was it, something like 9 and 10? thought they were at some point at least going to have enough money to do the things they, they want to do. Uh, you know, I once, uh, uh, Gary Hart, who I've spent some time talking to for my next book, told me once that, uh, you know, he thought it, in his worst moments he feared it would take a depression to, to change the political dynamic that Raheem was talking about, where we could get sort of broad, broad changes to uh, updating and changes to our social contract, to our, poli to our you know, slate of policies. Uh, he, may, he may be right, and, and, and if he is, I think this is why we're understanding now that this recession, bad as it is, wrenching it is, is not, in fact, a depression. Because you look at the millennial attitudes toward business and toward their own expectations, and you see that it, it has actually not shaken f the foundation of attitudes in the country. And probably that has something to do with the yawing inequality that we saw, uh, you know, were intensified during the Bush years, that this, this recession has had a, as, as, as wrenching as it is, has had a disproportionate effect on people at one end of the income level, but actually a relatively mild effect on people at the other end of the income level. Uh, it is not a we're all in the same boat, uh, you know, and it's, and it's time to reevaluate our bedrock ideas kind of moment that we understand the Great Depression to have been, and I think those comparisons are overwrought. So, Eli, what is that, or 
go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, and as, as Paul pointed out in his introductory slides, you know, the, the unemployment is affecting this generation arguably more than any other, and right now, they're, they're kind of rolling with it, and they're going to school, and they're doing things, but if this is a long, drawn-out period of unemployment, and they don't feel change and, and any, any answer or solution to that, that's, that's certainly a point of frustration, and, and it, it's not necessarily a liberal or conservative issue at that point. It's a who's in charge right now, and why aren't they, why aren't they addressing my problems kind of issue. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I think just to get all the pieces on the table here, I think one other piece that we can't ignore is uh, the previous president. And, uh, you know, a lot of this is sort of uh, mischaracterized as unique attributes of uh, the Bush administration, of, of the Obama campaign, versus, uh, you know, spending eight years with the Republican brand as, as seen through the lens <coughs> of the Bush administration and finding it wanting in a whole bunch of ways and, um, you know, and, and, and going somewhere else. Um, and, you know, I think that was a defining uh, experience for uh, a lot of us who, who came up during that time. But I also think, um, you know, it, it demonstrates how quickly uh, things can shift, that the Republican brand right now has actually managed to move itself already fairly far away from association with George Bush, even though I, I don't think the policies have changed significantly, but the, but the way people see those things um, has. I would just add to that that it's not just about the personality of Bush. It's about the about the values that are at the forefront, you know. And and the slide Scott showed are the the two value dimensions where this generation is the most distinct are on social values, things like homosexuality and inclusiveness, and trust and confidence in government. And in many ways, the Republican Party brand that these folks grew up with uh, was was just defined by things that were just antithetical to them. But there are other dimensions that are not that, that distinctive. And if the, de if the debate and the discussion shifts to a discussion about the role of business in the free market, the millennials aren't that different in that respect. Even as Scott said, in, 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 we didn't show the slide, but said, even when it comes to broader debates over the social safety net, they're not necessarily that distinctive or different or liberal, so to speak. So the Democrats have some core advantages on the two dimensions that have defined debate in recent years, social issues and sort of confidence, you know, bigger, bigger trust in government kind of issues. But, but if the debate moves off of those issues or those dimensions, there are, there, you know, it's not clearly that much of a democratic advantage. I mean, arguably, you could, you could say that um, the biggest advantage in terms of underlying values that the Democrats have with respect to this generation are on the social issues, which have been completely off the radar right. for the past year. Yeah. And so to the extent that um, people are updating their political um, predispositions based on what they're seeing out there, all the judgments being based on the perceived ineffectiveness of government in dealing with a very serious economic situation, and none of it on the social issues which were so important in the 2000. Uh, for campaign and in you know in in other Republican uh, campaigns. And just but before that gets set, it's it's social issues and foreign policy to some extent, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So it's two of the three kind of. Mm -hmm. But even if social issues are not on the front burner right now, if you when you get to an election and choosing between a Democratic House, a Republican House, Democratic Senate, Republican Senate, this November, and you think are there changes that could result? from a Republican majority, is that something I mean, that young people are likely to, oh, to shift their focus back to social issues if they think that there's some I potential? don't think there's any, uh, there doesn't appear to be any space for that to happen yeah. in terms of the camp, I mean, the campaigns are not talking, you know, are not likely to be talking about them. And part of the, oh, I'm sorry. You know, Judy, I think the social issue thing is, is really, I mean, you don't want to generalize. They're always going to be there and, and uh, and, and, and matter in ways we can't always predict, but that really is a boomer-driven thing. That really is about, I mean, that, that, that really is about a peculiar and particular generation whose sort of anti-establishmentism and moral self-righteousness and cultural division dating back to the 1960s came to dominate American politics for a long, rather worthless moment. Um, and, wow. And, uh, and, Ouch. And I, I really... <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so I really, I, really, uh, I really don't think that, you know, if we're talking about millennials here, but I really, right. again, down a sliding scale of generation, and I think Obama represents the leading edge of that, I really don't think those issues, those, those issues 
that I grew up with are going to have the potency in the political arena. Right. And that, one of the most hot buttons. It's cyclical. And one of the most hot button of those being abortion, which we see, this the millennials are, if anything, as conservative, if not a little for, more. For a wide variety of reasons, both both right. technological and and just the evolution of social attitudes and the evolution of technology, where I think. You know, abortion is one issue where that really comes into play. There is a broader consensus among younger Americans than the sort of political parties would necessarily say there is or then they would necessarily find they have an interest in, 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 in acknowledging. So if social issues are not going to keep the younger, the millennials connected to Democrats, what would? And, and again, I'm going to keep asking, what's the opening for Republicans to, to make headway? Uh, I think that, you know, when you're looking at the mix of social issues, it, it, things equilibrate, things change. So if you look at what someone who's a self-identified social conservative believes circa 2010 versus what a self-identified social conservative believes circa 1980 was very different. Uh, Ronald Reagan campaigned against uh, incredibly onerous state initiatives kind of banning, uh, you know, gay teachers from teaching in public schools. That's not on the map. Forty-nine states permit uh, same-sex uh, couples to adopt children. Uh, many people argue, including Chris Caldwell of the Weekly Standard, that that's when the gay marriage debate really ended, when you decided that gay parents are fit, quote-unquote, to raise children. Uh, and everything else is just this kind of long cultural lag that follows that. So I think that that's an important thing to keep in mind. I think Scott raised a very astute point. When you're looking at Obama's erosion, he already was fairly weak with non-college whites. Where has been his erosion been. It's been happening with college-educated white voters. It's so far been relatively gentle, but it could accelerate. And that's interesting. And if the social issues were seen as more salient, maybe that wouldn't be the truth, or maybe that wouldn't be the case. One thing that I think is very kind of important to keep in mind about how Republicans are going to position themselves, how social conservatives are going to position themselves, you know, kind of as we go forward, is that when you're looking at this survey, 21 percent of millennials are married, 12 percent of them have children. Now, when you look at any generation, the, the folks who have three or more children are the ones who are actually shaping that generation in terms of its, the next generation in terms of its sensibilities and what have you. I'd love to know the 20 percent who are married, the 12 percent who have children now, that is to say who are the ones who are getting started relatively early, uh, what are their values like, where are they living, what kind of communities, what are their political sensibilities, how do they feel about the prospect of inflation and a variety of other kind of threats that are raised by the right? It's an interesting thing to think about. But they're probably Go not ahead. having three kids anymore, I can say. Well, <laughs> we might have to readjust the definition. If we stop the homebuyer's tax credit, maybe they can afford it. And, and <laughs> well, before we go to Michael and, and Scott to answer that question about, everybody get ready because I'm about to come to all of you for your question. Do you want to try to tackle what he just raised? I mean, I, I, I have not looked at that in the new survey, but it's, it's the case in all, all the surveys that married people are more conservative, uh, more Republican-leaning than, than unmarried people. And for the kinds of young people who are getting married early, that, that pattern probably holds up. And we'll look at that. Just uh, to your question about, you know, how do de you know, where do Democrats hold on to these folks? Right. Um, you know, I think uh, when you have a generation that is less attached to kind of uh, religious institutions and religious practice, you know, yes, they may pray, but going to church less or synagogue or whatever, um, you know, they look for meaning in other places. And I think um, part of what made 2008 a transcendent moment uh, was it offered a, a, a story about national meaning that resonated with this uh, generation. Bush also offered a story about uh, national meeting, but it, it, it didn't resonate, I would argue, with most people who are millennials. But, uh, you know, story Obama... Story being first African-American president? No, uh, about uh, rebirth and renewal, about uh, building a stronger America, respect in the, in the world. Working together. Um, I mean, that was a big part of his theme, too. Exactly. And um, I think that, that the, um, you know, we've lost sight of that strand of the politics of meaning. So, you know, there's an intra-democrat conversation going on right now about you kind of scale back and do small kind of incremental um, uh, bits and pieces that everybody can like, or do you cast this large vision? I'd argue to keep these people at least, you have to have some sense of kind of, we are a country that is working in the world, um, building a green economy, uh, you know, addressing uh, uh, the ills that, that are happening elsewhere, um, and um, that's what this that's what this brand is about. I think if you lose that thread of meaning, you know, people people will go elsewhere for it. So green economy and staying engaged in the world. Yeah, uh, green economies, you know, uh, uh, and and a foreign policy that reflects our, our values. But um, but I'm not. But I'm deliberately not saying it's not issues. You know, that's the, the point is uh, people always want to 
to, to break it down into issues. It's a vision, and it's a sense of, um, of where we're headed as a society that we're all participating in um, that I think is, is missing, and that, and that George Bush, although I disagreed with it, if you look at his second inaugural speech, definitely there was a vision there that, that people could relate to. Well, I mean, I, I, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. All right, uh, raise your hand, I'm, get ready to call, I'll call them. Can I just, can I just jump in? Yeah. Just to, uh, both respond to Rand's point and to slightly correct it. 21% of this age group is married. Paul. 34%, 21% of this age group is married. 34% of this age group are parents. 12% of this age group are married with children living in their household. That's an incredibly, incredibly useful and interesting point yeah. because it also speaks to some of this incredible kind of class stratification right. when you're looking right. at family structure. And yeah. then to your additional question, so what does that mean in terms of political values? I haven't looked at it all the way through, but I'm fairly confident in saying the 12% who are married and living with their children tend to be more traditional and more conservative across a range of of, of political and social issues as one might expect. 